Christopher Muritz was born on November 3, 1972, in Smithtown, New York. Mr. Muritz's parents were Irvin and Tony Muritz, and he has one brother, Donald. His dad was a civil engineer and safety officer at their local VA hospital, and his mom was a stay-at-home mom. He and his family then moved to Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and he lived there until he left for military service. He enlisted when he was 18 years old and was in the United States Air Force. He joined the Air Force because he had an uncle that was in it, and he said he really enjoyed his time there. He also had a cousin serving there for a year at a time. At that point, Mr. Muritz thought that the Air Force suited him the most. When he departed for training camp, he flew out of Harrisburg and down to San Antonio, Texas. He said he really bonded with the people he rode down with. They instantly bonded and ended up serving at a boot camp together. He went to Lockland Air Force Base. He ended up having a great experience there and got to meet many good friends and discover more about himself. When he arrived at boot camp, he said that the first few days were the most challenging days. They had to do one thing after another and were constantly moving around. He then tried out for special forces and had to do exercises, like doing 20 laps in the pool as fast as he could. Then right after, they had to run a mile and a half and then do as many push-ups as he could in, in two minutes, sit-ups in two minutes, pull-ups in two minutes, and floor kicks in two minutes. He said it was a challenge, and he was at the top of his group, but he decided not to go to the special forces. Mr. Muritz said he got through it by looking to God to get through things, and he had to make that choice to ask for help and just get through it. Mr. Muritz did not receive any specialized training until he became a weather observer. Being a weather observer required having to go outside and making weather observations once an hour or as needed depending on severe weather. He got trained in weather radar and eventually next round radar. He said there were just various different map reading skills, satellite reading skills, because they had to do things with satellite cameras. When he was in Saudi Arabia, that was one of the things he did. They also had to do tactical setup so that if they were deployed somewhere, they would have to set up various different anemometers, which is to measure wind and more. He would go outside every hour at 55 after and would take a wind measurement, look at the temperatures and dew point, Look at the cloud conditions to determine whether it was scattered, what kind of cloud levels, what height they were. If they were under 5,000 feet, he could tell you what height they were just by looking at them. Then he would have to look at the various different markers around the horizon to see what the visibility was. He said that was the most important when planes were flying. When pilots would come in, they would brief them and give them weather conditions just to where they were going. Sometimes they would get transmissions from the pilots where they were already in the air and they wanted some updated conditions. They would brief them over the radar weather information. They would also go to local level officer staff to give them briefings. Something is. Started out in San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base, and then went to Rantoul, Illinois to Chanute Air Force Base. He had his training there. It was minus 56 degrees below zero with wind chill. They were about a mile away from the building where they trained at, so they ended up having to take a bus. After that, he went to Clovis, New Mexico to Canada Air Force Base and pretty much was there for the rest of his time until he went to Saudi Arabia. Operation Desert Storm was where the U.S. military mobilized and some other countries around the world mobilized to go to Saudi Arabia to free Kuwait and to push Iraq out of Kuwait to get them away from the Saudi Arabian border. It was caused by the fact that Iraq preemptively attacked Kuwait and they took over Kuwait for a while and they were lined up along the border of Saudi Arabia. He had many thoughts going through his head while traveling to Saudi Arabia. It took 31 hours to get there. He flew from Lovington, Texas to Chicago, from Chicago to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to somewhere in England, and then from England to Frankfurt, Germany. And then from Frankfurt, he went to Saudi Arabia. On the plane, he said he was thinking about all these things. He said, you have so much time to think about things, so you have to distract yourself, and so I read a lot of books and things like that. And so that got me through it. also saw many sites on his tour to Saudi Arabia. Every Tuesday, he would have trips that if he had time off, he could elect to do. He would try to do as many of those as he could. 
he went to the second largest date farm in the world. He said it was pretty cool because you're driving along in the desert. You see sand dunes everywhere. And as you're driving along, all of a sudden you see this canal of water running through the desert. And eventually you see this one little area and it goes down to a valley. And that's where all of this lush green area was. Nothing but a date, you know, a date plantation. And so that was just fascinating just seeing that and talking to the people who were there. He went and saw some gentlemen who were made pottery, and he was working with an old potter's wheel. He went to some Saudi Arabian small mark, small villages and helped at some of the local places. He went to a local carpet mart that was in the middle of the desert. He went to Bahrain on a trip. He said it was a little island in the Persian Gulf, and it was just so different from Saudi Arabia. To hail the measure, and as I'm doing that, these three guys are walking towards me. And, and you can tell they're very angry. I recognized the one guy as the second in command of the base. And so I stopped and I saluted. And as I went to salute, he didn't salute back. This other guy saluted. And when he went to salute, his hat blew off. So he didn't finish saluting to me. And he's chasing after his hat. And I'm thinking they didn't release me. So I'm standing here like this the whole time. Like, do I go get the guy's hat or what? So I stayed where I was. And he comes back and he, he was angry. It turns out he was the general of the base. And he was trying to figure out what in the world was going on. Why didn't the flight line find out about this bad weather? And again, it wasn't our fault. It was the mock, the mobile, the mobile command who didn't get the information out. And so I'm talking to him, explaining why I'm outside, because he was yelling at me. He was poking me in the chest. He was angry. But then once he figured out that this was my job, it was what I was supposed to do, the next day he invited me to go eat lunch with him. And that was like the coolest experience, you know, that I, that I had over there, or one of the coolest. He offered to take me up in an F-16C, which is a two-seater F-16, and it's a training thing. And he was going to fly me over Iraq. But the only thing was, for him to do that, I would have to stay one more tour. And I was like, no, I want to go home. So I was done. Mr. Miritz was promoted to be a senior airman for all of his good acts. His responsibilities included being in charge of the Weather Observer Group and being in charge along with another soldier of supply. Mr. Miritz has said and shown that he likes to keep things busy and find ways to make things easier. Throughout his whole military career, he did this. This helped keep him distracted from everything that was going on. One thing that Mr. Miritz did to help get promoted was fixing the Weather Observer's vis visibility map that they had. He, re he realized that the map was very difficult to read, especially for the new airman coming in. So, he took the extra time and he mapped out everything that the observers needed to see. Because all of his hard work, he was promoted to senior airman very early on. In the Air Force, Mr. Merritt made many friendships and camaraderies. He described making friends in the military as, You had to bond, there was no other choice. Someone who he had the closest relationship with was his cousin, who was also serving in the Air Force at this time. Every place that his cousin went, Mr. Miritz followed, from Chanute Air Force Base to New Mexico and to Saudi Arabia. He described this constant following each other as the family curse. Mr. Miritz did not know that his cousin was going to be in Saudi Arabia until one guy pointed out to him there was another guy that had the same name as him. Mr. Miritz and his cousin became very close during this experience and even went hiking, caving, and went on other little trips together all the time. Along with his cousin as a friend, the soldiers in the Weather Observer Group and the man he roomed with were also close friends to him. He described the people he worked with as absolutely fantastic and his roommate was really amazing. Mr. Miritz enjoyed all the relationships he formed while in the Air Force. He even described these friendships as the strongest ones he ever had and that he has nothing but positive things to say about these interactions. When the war ended, Mr. Miritz was back in the United States. There was a time where Mr. Miritz had to stop what he was doing and be prepared to be activated again. The plane was coming in when Saddam Hussein turned around and Mr. Miritz was released and did not have to go back to Saudi Arabia again. When Mr. Miritz came back to his hometown, everyone was welcoming him and thanking him for his service. It was a very positive homecoming for him. The transition from military life to civilian life was a little tricky, but not as bad as Mr. Mirich believed it would be. He was supposed to go to Millersville College, but ultimately was not allowed to when he was ready and ended up going to Harrisburg Area Community College until he was ready to go to Millersville. 
It was hard for him to adjust from having a lot of money to not having the money anymore. Also, when he retired, he had to get used to doing what he wanted and having freedom. He said that going to college just kept it kept him busy and kept his mind off of things. After his time in service, Mr. Merritt tried to find other soldiers but was not successful. The only people he did come in contact with was his cousin and one of his supervisor after she called him. After coming back to the United States, Mr. Merritt is not involved in any veterans organizations. Furthermore, since Mr. Merritt separated from the military, he became an ancient history teacher at Cedar Crest Middle School. He gives the credit of his career choice to being in Saudi Arabia and everything that he saw. Mr. Miritz also believes that if he did not go into the military, then he would have a different view on teaching and how he would, wouldn't be able to interact with the kids the same or be able to tell them all these stories about his experiences. Being in the Air Force significantly affected Mr. Miritz's life. He said, sometimes doing your best is not enough and you got to just do it and succeed. He applies this lesson to his own life and the way he teaches. Also, Mr. Maris believes that being in the Air Force gave him a different outlook on life. He sa even said, I don't think I would have been as successful at college and things like that if I went in when I was 18 versus when I was much older. To him, the military was a very positive experience and allowed him to have a job to serve others, just like the Air Force. This also leads him to be more successful with how he teaches his students. One life lesson that Mr. Mirich learned from being in the military was that people need to have an open mind and be as kind to others as much as they can. Another lesson he learned was that you just got to succeed and find a way. You don't give up. You work together as a unit, not by yourself. You don't just glorify yourself. You glorify the group together, working together to achieve unit success. Like many others, Mr. Merritt does not like war and hopes it will not happen. But he also realizes that sometimes it has to come to war. He wants others to know that families need to support the men and women who are going to war. It makes the whole situation a lot easier for the family and the soldier who has to fight something that is very difficult. His message he wants to share is when you go in, why are you doing it? And just all kinds of various different reasons you can go. Some people might be going for college tuition and GI Bill. Others go to seek new opportunities. Others who might be doing this to serve their country or to better their country. If Mr. Mirrors could go back and change anything he did in the military, he would go to the Air Force Academy and try to become a pilot. He was planning on doing this, but unfortunately he had hay fever and tried to go to the Academy. So that was how becoming a weather observer came to be for him. But ultimately he said, But you know... Things in my life right now would be totally different, and I wouldn't want to give that up either. While in service, Mr. Miritz had a few different uniforms. For his dress uniform, he would wear blue pants and a short-sleeved blue shirt, or long-sleeved. Then, while in operation or training, they would wear Bauer dress uniforms, camouflage uniforms with a tan shirt. But then, in Saudi Arabia... Mr. Miritz wore what they called chocolate chip uniforms, basically just a desert fatigue with black spots over the uniform. Also, Mr. Miritz received a few honorable medals from his service. One of the medals was from serving in Saudi Arabia. Another medal that he remembered receiving was the Commendation Medal for showing superior performance. Also, he received a medal for superior performal and Operation Inspection Medal, Good Service, honorable discharge, and a basic training medal. He explained that how he received the medals was by doing what was necessary and going above and beyond what he could do. To Mr. Muritz, it is important that you recognize and are thankful to the people that are serving our country now and at any time. It is difficult to give up everything and to become a soldier. So these men and women deserve to get the respect and credit they deserve. We are very thankful that Mr. Mirritz took the time to help us with our Veterans History Project. Also, thank you so much, Mr. Mirritz, for serving our country and allowing America to be, to be and stay free forever. Your efforts in the military will never be forgotten.